I would like to welcome you all to today's presentation, the intersection between trauma and the environment. This is day one of a day two uh, series. I am Stacy Hall, program manager for Align Health Solutions. Align is a strategic partner in the National COVID Resiliency Network. This training is a collaboration between Alliance, Northeast and Caribbean Addiction Technology Transfer Center, the Institute of Research, Education and Services in Addiction, and the US Virgin Islands Children and Youth Task Force. Now, without further ado, I'm delighted to introduce our trainer for today, Dr. Rocio Chain. Dr. Chain is a clinical psychologist and is the assistant professor of psychology at UConn Health in Farmington, Connecticut. Dr. Chain has published in the area of childhood and adult trauma and has presented at a wide variety of regional and national scientific meetings. She is a trainer of Wellness Recovery Action Plan, Think Trauma Curriculum, Restorative Justice Practices, and Peer Support Services. Dr. Chain serves on, a, on several committees of the National Child Traumatic Stress Network and is a peer reviewer of the Journal of Racial and Ethnic Health Disparities. We are in excellent hands for today's presentation. Dr. Chang, the floor is yours. Many thanks. Um, I'm really excited to be with all of you. I'm really looking forward to, um, to do this presentation. And um, well, I hope that um, I'm, I'm always learning whenever I, I do these presentations. I, I learned a lot from all of you. So I'm really looking forward to, um, to get to know you a little bit, even though this is an online training and um, you know, there is limited uh, opportunities for interactions. So, um, and thank you so much for sending the in the chat where you are from. Uh, I welcome you again. Excellent. So I'm going to start by um, by getting into the presentation, and as I'm going along, probably you will get to know me a little bit more in terms of um, why I'm doing what I'm doing. But maybe I can just share with you a little bit about um, who I am and why this topic is of interest to me. Um, as you can hear from my thick accent, I'm originally not from the US, I'm originally from Peru. Um, I've been in this country longer than in my own country. So it's been um, about three decades that um, I have lived in, in, in the US, in, in the state of Connecticut. And um, I have completed all my education, my graduate school here. And I don't believe that things are um, done by chance. I think that there is some, there is a real purpose for why we are all here today. And um, it happened to be that my real purpose was to become a psychologist and specialize in the trauma area. Um, and I say that um, because I think that part of what I have done in my professional life has incredibly helped me in my personal life as well. So I, I, I definitely come from, um, I believe with professional expertise, but I also can um, utilize all the resources and tools that we're gonna be uh, sharing together here in my own life and um, in the lives of my loved ones. So, um, and I truly hope that this can bring a well to you. I am wondering if anybody is going to present these slides or if I'm going to do it. Karen, okay. I will just go ahead with these slides too. The, the disclaimer slides? Yes. Um, yeah, you, you can okay. go through sure. that. Okay. Perfect. Okay. So the development of these training materials um, was supported by the grant TI 082504 uh, from the Center for Substance Abuse Treatment, Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, the Department of Health and Human Services. And the content is the sole responsibility of the Northeast and Caribbean Addiction Technology Transfer Center and does not necessarily represent the official views of SAMHSA. For um, ATTC, 
it is important uh, to use the use of affirming language that inspires hope and advances recovery. Language, as we all know, matters, words are power, and people are first. And the ATPC network uses affirming language to promote the promises of recovery by advancing evidence-based and culturally informed practices. And I'm very um, grateful to be collaborating with the ATPC and all the other agencies that have been mentioned uh, this afternoon. So part of my training, part of what I will share with you comes from this curriculum that I love and it's, uh, it's actually, I, I believe that um, I have adapted as my own um, baby and child and now probably adolescent um, since, since um, I have been doing this uh, curriculum or training this curriculum for a long time. And it's called Think Trauma. And it has been developed by the National Child Traumatic Stress Network um, Juvenile Justice Consortium. So I'm not quite sure how many of you know the National Child uh, Traumatic Stress Network. I will hope that if you don't know um, this network, you could check it out at your um, any convenient time. The mission of the National Child Traumatic Stress Network is to raise the standard of care and improve access to services for traumatized children, their families and communities throughout the United States. And um, I am very grateful that I'm being part of this network for many, many years. Um, and I met the uh, psychologist who co-developed the first thing trauma curriculum, uh, Monique Kumalo, who has been really a mentor and an amazing trainer. Um, and well, since she co-developed think trauma curriculum, then there have been other uh, um, psychologists and psychiatrists who have contributed to the development of version two, which is the one that I will be sharing with you and can be found the whole curriculum in the NCTSN website. So for this, um, this uh, afternoon, I will be covering a modified version of the Think Trauma Curriculum, Module 1, Trauma Module 1, Trauma and Radical Healing. And then um, I will be presenting um, another presentation that has more components and elements of radical healing and our work. So why do we talk about trauma and why do we want people to think more about how trauma impacts ourselves, our communities, our environment. Um, we need to consider that how we explain behavior is directly linked to how we handle it. And this is why it's important to think about trauma. Trauma is not an excuse for behavior, but an explanation for it. And understanding the impact of trauma gives all of us more tools to do our job, make everyone safer, and help youth and others build healthier lives and better futures. Okay, so because we're going to talk about trauma, it is so important that we do our self care alert, right? This work is not easy is very rewarding and at times can be very challenging at the same time, right? So when I go and I, you know, we, we are going to engage in these conversations, if there is some moments where you feel triggered, you can do any or all of the above. Step out and take a break, talk to someone you trust or do something regulating. And, you know, doing something regulating means different things for all of us, right? So, but definitely let's take this into consideration uh, before we engage into the rest of the training. So our learning objectives for today is to define trauma and describe how it differs from everyday stress, view behaviors through a trauma lens, and better understand the role of resilience and recovery in buffering the effects of traumatic events and promoting health and development. 
So the first question for all of us is to think about how would you define trauma? And what is it that makes something traumatic as opposed to just stressful? Okay, so keep this up these questions in mind. And then I want you to watch this video with me. And this video, I don't know how many of you uh, have watched Freedom Riders. It's a movie that came out, I think in the late 1990s, early 2000, where it's based in a real story uh, that happened in Los Angeles, California, and you are meeting here the new, the newest teacher in this new in, in this school, uh, Mrs. Wu, who is this is her first day, and um, and and she's really you will see her very excited to be uh, to be there, and um, and I would like for you to see what happens during a very short period of time here and how you can relate some of the behaviors um, to trauma, maybe. Okay, so let me see. Yeah. Welcome to Freshman English. I'll give this bitch a week. Hi. Um, okay, Brandy Ross, Gloria Muniz, Alejandro Santiago, Andre Bryant, Eva Benitez, Eva, not Eva, Eva. I have to go to the bathroom. Okay, uh, make sure that you yeah, take I know. Uh, Ben Daniels. That white boy hoping he's in the wrong room. We gotta get out of here. Cindy Nagor. Right here. Is that correct? Jamal Hill. Man, what am I doing in here? This old ghetto-ass class has got people in here looking like a bad rerun of cops. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Shoot. Are you Jamal? Yeah. Well, for some reason, they have you registered in this class. Man, that's some bullshit. It's the dumb class, cuz. Means you're too dumb. <laughs> Man, say it to my face, cuz. I just did. You see what I mean? <laughs> dumb. Man, I know you ain't talking to me. Um, okay. Ooh. Look, homie, I beat that ass, homeboy. Can you please sit back Look, down? Look, I got your spot on the scene. That's why you're over there wagging your tongue. Please sit back in your seat. Look, your spot is good as gold. I don't know why you keep wasting your time coming to practice with them two-year-old nights on your feet. You don't know nothing about me, cuz. Okay. Broke down my whole situation. Come on. Excuse me, may I please get some help in here? Aaron? Aaron, this is Brian Guilford. He teaches junior English and the Distinguished Honors class. Oh, yes. Hi, Aaron Gruel. Nice. nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. We saw a little action today, I hear. Yeah, it happened so fast. I... Uh, well, don't be discouraged. You put your time in, in a few years, you'll be able to teach juniors. Mm -hmm. They're a pleasure. By then, most of your kids will be gone anyway. What do you mean? Well, eventually, they just stop coming. Well, if I do my job, they might be lining up at the door. Right? <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> nice. All right. So I hope that um, you have some reactions. And please feel free to, um, to share any of your reactions now. Oops. Now I can just, OK. Uh, through the chat, and um, and we will be able to read them. Uh, so does this behavior look familiar to you? And if it does, in what ways are the characters in this story like the youth you work with? 
Now, I'm not quite sure if all of you are working with um, adolescents or youth, or you know, if these experiences are um, completely um, or directly related to the experiences that you have. Um, but I want you to, if he, if they are not, I want you to think about, you know, in uh, some moments, some behaviors that at times we cannot really explain uh, from people who we served. Uh, and logically, we don't really have an accurate explanation about why they are doing the things that they are doing. Um, until until you get a little bit more of the big picture about what's happening. So just hold on to that. And then I also want you to think about what beliefs do the staff in the clip have about this youth, right? So, you know, what beliefs that Mrs. Gruel had about uh, the kids in her classroom when she came for the first time. And what about the other two people who she sat and, and talked to later on? And what do you believe contributes to the way these young people think, feel, and behave? In other, in other words, what happened to these kids that made them behave um, like that, what, like what we watch? Right, so let's see now. Now, with these three holding questions, I also want you to, I'm gonna show you a little bit more of this movie that if you haven't watched, I would highly recommend it you to, to do so. Um, so, you know, days went by, this teacher gained the trust little by little. She gained the trust of the students and now, you know, there is one day that she's actually, she notices that the students were very behind academically. And what, what her purpose was for her was to try to make the kids um, start writing more, right? And also reading more. So one of the ways that she did this was by asking them, first by bringing these notebooks that you see at the desk, and, and she's asking them, you know, she's bringing these brand new notebooks and she's telling them, you know, take this notebook. Um, this is for each of you. I want you to tell me a story. We all have stories and it can be of anything. It can be even writing um, a song or a poem, some story. Um, I'm not gonna... I'm not gonna evaluate your grammar or your syntax or anything like that. I, all that I want is for you to write. And if you want me to read what you're writing, then you see this lacquer and she's showing the kids a lacquer. Ah, uh, you can place your notebook here. I'm gonna read what you write. And you know, this lacquer is only gonna be, it's, it's gonna be luck at the end of the day. And I am the only one who has access to the lacquer. So imagine all the different containment that this teacher without knowing anything about trauma was actually building and doing for these kids who, um, who had a lot of different issues trusting especially adults, especially from that school, from that environment. And I'm gonna let you know a little bit more about what she's finding out in those notebooks. As you can see, all of the students decided that they want the teacher to read her, their stories. And not only that, um, you know, this is her opportunity to read the stories because she was, all on her own on a day that it was a parents conference. She was ready with her banner. She was ready with her lemonade and chocolate cookies. And maybe you could guess that not, not many people show up for the parents conference. So, and if we go a little bit farther, she had the whole time to read these stories because 
nobody showed up. Um, so I also want to let you know that as a warning, that this is a very difficult part of the movie in which, in which we listen to very difficult experiences. So I want you, your brain and your body to be ready for this, okay? And I think that I had done the work with the video, so it should work, right? Yes, okay. In every war, there is an enemy. I watched my mother being half beaten to death and watched as blood and tears streamed down her face. I felt useless and scared and furious at the same time. I could still feel the sting of the belt on my back and my legs. One time, he couldn't pay the rent. And that night, he stopped us on the street and pointed to the concrete. He said, pick a spot. Clyde was my boy. He had my back plenty of times. We was like one fist, me and him, one army. Heavy. Yeah. It's the real shit right here. Nobody jump us now. We gotta practice. Cause this, this got power. You shoot it, it breaks. I sat there until the police came. But when they come, all they see is a dead body, a gun, and a nigga. They took me to juvenile hall. First night was the scariest. Inmates banging on the walls, throwing up their gang signs, yelling out who they were, where they from. I cried my first night. Can't never let nobody know that. I spent the next few years in and out of cells. Every day I worry, when will I be free? My brother taught me what the life is for a young black man. Do what you have to. Pimp. Deal, whatever. Learn what colors to learn. Gang boundaries. You can say on one corner, you can't say on another. Learn to be quiet. The wrong word can get you popped. If you look in my eyes, you'll see a loving girl. If you look in my smile, you'll see nothing wrong. If you pull up my shirt, you'll see the bruises. What did I do to make him so mad? At 16, I've seen more dead bodies than a mortician. Every time I step out my door, I'm faced with the risk of being shot. To the outside world, it's just another dead body on the street corner. They don't know that he was my friend. During the war in Cambodia, the camp stripped away my father's dignity. He sometimes tries to hurt my mom and me. I feel like I have to protect my family. I was having trouble deciding what candy I wanted. But then I heard gunshots. I looked down to see that one of my friends had blood coming out of his back and his mouth. The next day, I pulled on my shirt and got strapped with a gun I found in an alley by my house. I don't even know how this war started. It's just two sides who tripped each other way back. Who cares about the history behind it? I am my father's daughter, and when they call me to testify, I will protect my own no matter what. Nobody cares what I do. Why should I bother coming to school? My friends are soldiers, not of war, but of the streets. They fight for their lives. I hate the cold feeling of a gun against my skin. It makes me shiver. It's a crazy ass life. Once you're in, there's no getting out. Every time I jump somebody in and make someone a part of our gang, it's another baptism. They give us their life, we give them a new one. I've lost many friends who have died in the undeclared war. So now you heard a little bit more about what was happening to these kids, right? There are some things that we cannot see, right? And unless they tell us their stories. Um, what we see is their behaviors. And many times their behaviors, you know, do not match with our expectations. Um, and what we see is the environment, right? The environment that um, is also there, 
uh, that can be supportive, can contain, or it can be uh, dismissive, and, or it can be abusive, and many other, you know, uh, uh, it, it can have many other connotations to it. Um, but it definitely has an impact, right? In a positive way or in a negative way. So if we will be in a room together, we will have a conversation here, um, but because we are making it online, I hope that you use the chat um, to, to write some of your answers um, and reactions. So if you could share or think about what was your reaction as you watched the clip? What events did you see that you considered traumatic? And what types of traumatic events have the clients you work with experienced? Okay. Um, if you don't do direct services, you could answer about what types of traumatic events have the people who you served um, experience, right? And um, Karen, if there is anything in the chat, it would be great if you could um, read it out loud. Um, if I'm afraid that if I go into the chat, then it will show up in my um, in my sharing screen. Yes, many comments coming in. Okay. Um, exposure to violence. These were all innocent children affected by their environment. Extremely traumatic experience, experiences can drive people to low self-esteem and self-defeating behaviors. Abuse, neglect, domestic violence, substance abuse, um, witnessing abuse, um, prejudgment, past issues, family dynamics, trauma, um, uh, struggling students, yes, uh, and, and realizing the home life priorities of struggling students takes away from their education. Um, the reaction that someone is uh, has experienced is sadness, mm -hmm. um, gang-affiliated gun violence, domestic violence. It's a movie, but it's a reality. Um, Yes. abuse, physical, emotional, um, and, and dealing with their emotions by acting out in a negative way, environmental factors, violence, rape, incest, um, and impacting the family unit, um, difficult to listen to, difficult to watch, abuse, violence, hopelessness, fight or flight mode. Yes. Thank and, you. Yeah. Okay. They're coming are there in. more? <laughs> there, are, there are more, there are more, but we can um, we can move forward if you'd like. Awesome. Well, Karen, this is amazing. Thank you so much. I, I really appreciate that you, you sent all your messages and we definitely want to read them all. Um, and one of the things is you are absolutely, um, you know, um, correct this Unfortunately, these stories do not only happen in movies. Unfortunately, these are real stories. And um, they happen more often than what we would like to admit. Uh, and the other piece is that this movie, as I mentioned before, was, was based on a true story. And it happened to this, the, the stories of kids. And, um, and they even wrote a book about these stories and they're really hard to um to process to digest and and at the end you know the movie brings us a, an amazing um experience of hope because um these kids were able to graduate from high school uh in, against all odds right like you heard this um other teacher and the principal of the school, they were not really expecting this class to move farther than junior year. And um, this teacher, the Mrs. Gruel, didn't believe that. She thought that these students could graduate if she did a good job. And she did an amazing job. 
And these kids were able to graduate. Many of them were actually the first one in their families graduating from high school. And then they move on to go to college too. And the teacher now has a foundation in California where she teaches other teachers to, you know, to attend to the needs of their, their students. Um, so she keeps on making the difference, but she keeps on making the difference with many of her own alumni that are part of this foundation too, and they are educating educators, but they, I believe that they educate all of us in terms of how we can continue making a difference in people's lives. So um, I will move on, but I can talk a lot about freedom writers. So you are absolutely also in target when you're saying, when you already describe what is a traumatic event in your comments. So I really appreciate that too. So what is a potentially traumatic event? We talk about the three E's of trauma exposure, and this has to do with, let me see if it comes out. Um, first, I want you to ask yourself, has the youth, ex um, ask yourself, has the youth experienced a traumatic event? Consider how experiencing a traumatic event impacts how youth feel in detention, but also in other contexts, in other environments, right? Um, in the environments that you provide services. Let me see if I can just move into the three E's. Um, so the three E's are the events, right? What happened to them, the experiences, um, and the effects. So these are some of the things that we're gonna consider when we are experiencing, when we are talking about potentially traumatic events. Now, if we move on, when we talk about events, we talk about exposure to actual or threatened death, serious injury or sexual violation. And sexual violation was added in the DSM-5. Right, um, experiences um, talks about how a person experiences a potentially traumatic event can vary from person to person, but with trauma, the event is experienced as harmful. Okay, and the other E for effects, uh, we, we focus on traumatic events that can affect short and or long term adverse events effects on a person's physical social, emotional, and spiritual health that may show up immediately or later in a person's life, right? And as we know now, you know, it can happen to the individual. It can actually, um, the individual can listen that it has happened in their own environments, you know, a traumatic event happening in their own environments and their own communities. Um, and also, um, you could witness uh, a traumatic event that um, has happened to a loved one or somebody who you know. And the other piece that now we understand more and more is that uh, people not necessarily experience um, a trauma themselves, but workers like us, that day in and day out, are exposed to these stories, that could also be experienced as a traumatic as um as as traumatic as trauma symptoms for ourselves. So that's something that is important to recognize that you know sometimes we are not directly affected by a potentially traumatic event, but we might experience symptoms as a result of listening day in and day out um, to different types of trauma. Okay, so, you know, we are gonna talk a little bit about the juvenile justice, youth exposure trauma, but depending on who you are serving, you can really um, uh, apply 
similar definitions and concepts to your uh, to your own um, to your own group of people who you serve. Okay, you know this example of juvenile justice youth exposure to trauma is actually an eye opening for many of us. That ninety three percent of juvenile offenders reported at least one or more traumatic experience and on average reporting at least six with traumatic loss representing the most common exposure. Okay, so very highly rates of trauma in, in one particular context, in one particular group of uh, youth, right? So I want you to think about in your own environments, what do you guess or what do you know? How, what do you know about the percentage of um, trauma that is reported um, from the people who you served or the people who you work or in your communities? So if you can give us some ideas in the chat, I would greatly appreciate it. Another um, one that I have been, uh, you know, I have worked with has been in um, correctional facilities here in, um, in Connecticut. And the percentage of, um, of trauma in, in women's uh, correctional facilities are also very high, are above 93%. Uh, and unfortunately, they endorse more than one type of trauma. So the, the percentages are definitely uh, outrageous, say. Okay. So Karen, what are we seeing in the chat? Okay, so one person entered less than 50%. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not sure if that's, if anybody else wants to add what percentage mm -hmm. they feel is being reported in their um, communities. All right, but thank you. It seems that your, your community is he heading into the right direction and I hope that it will continue decreasing. Okay, now for the juvenile justice youth exposure to trauma, these are the reports that we know of. More than 60% endorse traumatic loss, separation, and bereavement. Um, about 55% endorse domestic violence. Emotional abuse is 50%. Physical abuse is 40%. Community violence is 45%. So you could see uh, the percentages, the high percentages, and the different types of uh, trauma that these kids are being exposed. Now, in adolescence, exposure to trauma in your communities, I want to ask, you know, I know that um, there are people now from many different parts of the US and also uh, from Virgin Islands, um, I'm not quite sure if St. Thomas and Puerto Rico, but if you could keep on uh, sending us your best estimates of percentages and the population that you are working with, that would be really great. Thank you. So now, as we are more aware about who we are serving, what are the percentages um, of trauma in the groups who we served? That can give us a very good understanding about, you know, what direction our treatment mod modalities need to take, right? And one of the things that we encourage um, ourselves and others is to think about um, utilizing principles for a trauma-informed system. And these are provided by SAMHSA, and they consist of six. So the first one is safety, and safety is a must, right? People who we serve need to feel that they they feel um, they, they can trust us a little, right, at the time, because they're not going to trust us 100% the first time that we meet. But we need to earn their, their trust by making them feel safe and making sure that we are, we are reassuring them that we are not there to hurt them, right? Now, because we have watched these 
two different parts of um, the movie Freedom Riders, I want you to think about ways that this, this teacher made, it, made her students feel safe. And one of the things that obviously you haven't watched the whole video so or, or the whole um, movie, but one of the things that I had to tell you that I truly admire every time that I watch this movie and I have watched it many, many times is the way that this teacher conduct herself, right? Giving the, the her students choices. I was telling you about, you know, even the choice of writing and allowing her to uh, read uh, the, the, the students' stories and how she sort of meticulously had some, some ideas about how to contain uh, the space for her students, providing uh, a, a lack, um, telling them that she was the only one that was gonna read her stories. Her stories were gonna be safe in this locker uh, with a lack, um, bringing them materials that um, were really, um, important for the students, listening to them, uh, bringing safety to the classroom by asking for help when she needed to, so she could, you know, contain um, and decrease the violence in the room. All of those things are principle, the first, um, the first big foundation for trauma-informed system uh, that starts with safety and making people feel safe, okay? Trust is another one that I mentioned already. And obviously we all know that trust is something that we build on and we keep on building and, you know, structure helps, containment helps, you know, uh, saying what we are gonna do and doing it helps. So reliability um, helps. Um, um, so all of these things, all of different characteristics that can help whenever we are building trust in the whole system and also in the direct contact with the people who we served. Empowerment, right? Um, if we think about these children, these youth, you know, um, many people did not believe in them, right? They even didn't believe in themselves. And here is one person who is seeing them and is seeing their whole potential and is empowering them to do better. Um, and, and, you know, it can have significant results. Now, collaboration is another important area, right? We cannot do the work by ourselves. It's a very important work, but it's a very demanding work. So having a system that um, can really help to do a good network and has support, that is important. Peer support and trauma competence is really a must, right? Um, we all benefit when we are connecting with others. We all also benefit when we do have the knowledge in order to continue building uh, the services that we will be proud of uh, engaging in and also proud of delivering. And this is also another important principle that is a must and is, it needs to be, um, you know, responding well uh, in the areas of culture, um, the historical aspects, linguistic needs, and uh, gender responsiveness, right? All of these characteristics that are so important are part of our environment, uh, are also part of uh, who we are uh, as individuals, but also as uh, group members. So, I'm not sure how many of you agree with this statement that we learn by experience. And when we say this, I want you to think about, you know, one sunny day that you decide to walk um, in, a, in a park and 
you are enjoying the walk and you know you're enjoying the breeze and everything else and now all of a sudden you see this right uh and when you see it i want you to tell me what do you think would be your first reactions what are you going to do if you see this um i want to call it a snake <laughs> um you know, some of us might be screaming and running. Some of us might feel paralyzed. Some of us might like the snake. You know, we do have all different reactions, but we definitely learn by experience, right? Our brain really stores this information in one way or another, but it will store it. So think about... Um, so I'm going to show you a little bit about what happens if you are afraid of snakes. Snakes, okay? So if you if if the experience of seeing a snake unexpectedly, right? You were not you were not um, planning to to see this. There are many different changes that happen in your brain and your body, and they do happen in a matter of milliseconds. So we cannot really, you know, even feel it, but they are happening to you. Okay. So here it is. There are different parts that get um, that get um, activated. So one of the parts that is not showing in this graph. It's actually in your brain. It's called the amygdala. It's on the side, it's, it's as, um, a site of an almond. Okay, so it's a tiny one. It's in our midbrain. I know that most of you, if not all of you, have heard of uh, the amygdala. The amygdala, we all have it. It acts like an alarm center. Okay, so whenever we see something or we smell something, there is some information that comes to our brain. If the amygdala detects some, some sort of danger, it will become activated. When the amygdala becomes activated, there are some hormones that are released, okay? And these hormones are released. Um, there is the adrenaline hormone and the cortisol hormone. So there is some danger, you know, our um, hypothalamus in the brain will connect, will sense our amygdala going off, and then it will send a signal for, um, for the release of these two hormones. So the adrenaline is the one that will um, make sure that your heart rate and your blood pressure increases. Okay, so that's how we feel the palpitations going like um, so rapidly, right? Then your breathing rate increases and you don't need to digest anything. So your digestion slows down, right? Your parasympathetic system will slow down and your sympathetic system is completely activated, right? There is tension in the muscles because now you are ready to fly, you're ready to flee or you're ready to freeze. Okay, and your brain and your body are really wired towards helping you to survive a dangerous moment, right? So that's the important piece. The cortisol, it will help you to numb your pain, okay? So if you're fighting, you're not going to feel, you're not going to feel any pain at the moment. You feel it later on, but not at the moment, right? Um, so the next time, that you go to the same park and you see this, your brain might, might get triggered, your amygdala might get triggered. And if you were afraid of snakes, your amygdala for a moment is not gonna see a host, it's gonna see a snake. And then the whole thing will repeat again, right? You will get ready to fly, to freeze or to flee, okay? So how many of you have had that experience already? Uh, other things that happen um, whenever we are facing something that our brain, our amygdala perceives as dangerous is that you get a dry mouth, right? Um, you, you begin sweating, your palms might be sweating. You know, you could feel your heart really racing very, very hard. 
right? And all that, you know, like your, your, your thinking process is mainly focused on surviving the moment, nothing else. You are not thinking about your brilliant future or anything like that, or your plans for tomorrow. You're thinking about how you're gonna survive the moment, okay? So here are some other things. I I see some, some comments, so Karen, can you share it with me? <laughs> Would that be okay? Sure, sure. Thank you. So um, the comments uh, regarding the snake uh, mm -hmm. were the fear and run and freeze. And then um, you have responses. Many uh, said, yes, yes, they have a few times. Um, mm -hmm. And then someone said they would guess 80 to 85% of experience trauma. In, mm -hmm. Yeah. In their communities with the populations who they serve. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for their comments. Okay. So we're going to go more. And how are we doing with the time, Karen? I should be more we're prepared. Doing, we're doing great. We have about 20 minutes until break, unless you'd like to break a little sooner or no. later. No, it's perfect. So it's okay to go for 20 more minutes. Let's see. These are these are the the, the parts that, um, that are really cool for me to teach you. Uh, so, or to share with you, because I know that many of you have already heard this. So understanding the brain is so crucial, right? And this is the part that for most of my clients, they really appreciate when they start um, learning more about you know, what happens to our brains when we experience trauma? And why, you know, it, it, it starts like, helps, it helps all of us, I believe. It helps us to sort of take away the shame and the blame that many people feel because of the behaviors that we just watch in the movie, right? Of things that, you know, my, we might be having a sort of okay day and all of the sudden, you know, our reactions do not match with what's happening in the environment. And there is an explanation for it. And we already started uh, talking about it. So when we start understanding more our brain, we know that, you know, the information that our brain processes it, it comes from our senses. And here you have this very nice sort of um, uh, draw drawings, right? And what you see here is that there are some important parts that we see. So the area in purple is our prefrontal cortex, right? That is, is the one that is developed later on. Right, so they say that for women is it fully develops, it fully completely, it fully develops when um, a woman reaches 24, 26 years of age. For men, it's a little bit later, so it might be 28, 30 years of age. Okay, here you see the nice amygdala uh, in red. And here, um, there are other two important aspects, uh, areas in the brain, the hippocampus and the uh, thalamus, okay? So with a survival brain, what the way that our brain will react is that our amygdala, as I mentioned already, will become activated, right? And and our amygdala becomes activated. It goes off when it's perceiving threat, it's seeing threat, it's remembering danger. So it can be triggered by something that our senses bring. And then our survival brain prepares us for protection, okay? Versus our learning brain, which is in a different sort of mode, right? When, when we have our learning brain um, functioning, then it means that the, our brain is controlling impulses, right? And it's thinking through decisions and effectively protecting us, um, using strategies that protect us, okay? And that's the learning brain comes more from our prefrontal cortex that can interact with our midbrain 
and with a relaxed amygdala, okay? So these, these are important things to remember because we are not making it up when we are in a survival brain, even when we are not facing current danger, right? Because our brain, if it is in a survival uh, mode, is going to make us feel as we are in danger when we are not. And that's what makes us uh, react to situations in unexpected ways. So here is a good video that I'm gonna show you. And it has been done by an amazing colleague from New York, Dr. Ham. The difference between a learning brain versus a brain in survival mode. So we'll just call it learning brain versus survival brain. And this is the difference. So learning brain is this brain that's open to learning new information and it's completely okay with ambiguity and grays and vagueness and it sees the big picture it like pulls back and is on the balcony can look over the forest and figure out what's going on on an emotional level people in learning brain feel calm peaceful maybe a little excited about what they're about to learn maybe a little playful and having fun too and definitely curious and they're not afraid of making mistakes because it's just part of the learning process and so they're not really thinking about themselves and they actually feel a little bit of confidence that if they just apply themselves they might pick up what they're trying to learn now survival brain on the other hand is completely different it's hyper focused on threat it doesn't like ambiguity it wants clear hard facts it thinks in black and white terms doesn't want anything to be gray at all. And then emotionally, you can imagine that survival brain makes people feel panicky, feel like a little obsessive and afraid of getting things wrong. And they don't feel calm and open to learning new things. They just want to get things over with. And people in survival brain also really don't like making mistakes and they are afraid of looking stupid too. So students in survival brain don't want to be picked on. They don't want to raise their hand and ask questions and look stupid. And so these people are also filled with doubt about their own ability to learn stuff. And they're afraid that other people can see how stupid they really are. Now, it's really important to understand how learning brain and survival brain interact. Because survival brain always trumps learning brain. And it makes sense because survival brain is just trying to save your life. And so if it thinks that there's something dangerous happening, you better pay attention to it, right? But the tricky thing is that as survival brain stays on longer and longer, it's harder to get out of that and it's harder to really go into a learning brain. And the way I think about it is kind of like the myth of Sisyphus. You know that guy who has to push a rock up a hill and then every day it falls back down and he has to do it over and over again? Well, being in learning brain is like being up on the high parts of that mountain. You can see the expanse of what's going on, but it also takes a lot of work to be up there. And at any second, if you're not paying attention and make, putting effort into it, it's so easy to slip back into survival brain again. And that rock that Sisyphus is trying to push up, well, that's kind of like stress. And the more stressed you feel, the heavier and bigger that rock gets, and it just pushes you back into survival brain quicker. Now, the kicker is that for traumatized people, stress is a really rigid and intense thing. And so with trauma, any little stress makes that rock grow way bigger than it normally would. And because people with trauma misperceive ambiguous situations as threatening and stressful, that rock just stays big all the time. Now, the good news is that the more you control stress, well, the easier it is to be in learning brain, right? Because that rock. So you got a little bit um, of this amazing information about what happens um, to these two different modalities of um, of our brain, right? And, and obviously now there is more hope because now we know that our brains have this plasticity and, you know, it takes work, but with work, with support and with a lot of consistency and perseverance, then, you know, many wonderful things could happen and we could definitely, um, you know, have more experience that come from our learning brain than our survival brain, okay? So we will talk a little bit more about this 
But I guess before I move on to, to um, the other aspects, you know, so then we understand how trauma, when, is, when it happens, you know, for prolonged periods of time, when it happens, when um, early on in our lives, you know, when we're growing up, when we're children, um, it has more, um, it has heavier consequences than when trauma happens, um, you know, at later on in our lives, right? So, you know, first of all, our brains are developing when we're children, you know, it start, starts when we are born. And I, I told you that, you know, your, our prefrontal cortex completely develops in our 20s, um, you know, mid-20s, late 20s. So, you know, there is some sort of um, risk that we all take when we are growing up. And um, if, if for whatever reason, children experience trauma and is for prolonged periods of time early on in their lives, then, you know, their amygdalas become more sensitive. And what happens is that they, they end up um, working extra, right? Working over time all the time. They are mainly hypervigilant and they are really looking to protect and they are in a survival brain most of the time. And that is because, you know, they had to respond so many times for prolonged periods of times. And unfortunately, they do not respond only to one type of trauma, um, oftentimes they respond to many different types of trauma for prolonged periods of time. So that's, you know, when we call, when we talk about complex trauma, when we talk about chronic trauma um, or developmental trauma, these are sort of serious uh, experiences that they were not isolated incidents. They were incidents that happened, unfortunately, multiple times in um, a person's life. And therefore, they end up with a amygdala, with an alarm center that, um, that whose mission is to protect, 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 even when it doesn't need to protect anymore, right? So the work can be done, and it is done in terms of helping the amygdala, helping our alarm centers to to recalibrate, to um, to sort of understand more when they need to when they need to go off and when they don't need anymore to go off, right? And that's many of the different therapy modalities. It really helps to um, you know help our brains and our bodies to uh, to make the the appropriate changes. So they are no longer living uh, mainly in with a survival brain. Because we definitely are gonna need our amygdalas. Our alarm centers are so important to all of us, but we don't want any alarm center to be overworking, um, you know, especially when we don't need them to, right? We just need them to work when we are facing current danger. All right, so when we talk about establishing safety, we talk about the first step is to connect with youth or with any group of people who you are serving in a trauma-informed manner, okay, to help them feel physically and psychologically safe. Those are important. And, you know, uh, Samsa goes into detail about, you know, for all of us to think about the places that we work uh, for instance, um, you know, what do we do in terms of um, how do we welcome the people who we serve? Um, you know, do we have enough lightning? Do we have messages that might be encouraging? Um, you know, is is a, is a, is the place that we we um, we are located is it safe enough? Are we are we providing some physically and also psychologically safety when our uh, clients or the people who we serve interact with us. 
So that's important to think about. So establishing safety, what can we do? Help youth feel safer by being present and engaged, right? Having a structure, having uh, activities that can contain them, create predictability, and balance firmness with caring. And that's super important. And it's not only important to adolescents. I think that it's important to any of us, right? So the other thing that we can do is to create a trauma-informed safety plan. And when we talk about a trauma-informed safety plan, is one tool that all staff may use to collaborate with a youth or anybody who you're serving who has experienced trauma. This is usually a plan shared between staff and youth to help youth use healthier coping strategies. And this is a very proactive way, right? We don't want to do an intervention when the, the alarm is already off. We want to proactively, and you know, sometimes we do have to, but, um, but proactively we can do a lot to prevent from an alarm to going completely off, right? And that's another way to bring more safety to the people who we served, to the environment where we are at, and also to continue building trust. So what that safety plan includes? It includes a brief trauma history. It also helps people to recognize what are the trauma reminders, okay? And that's really important. Sometimes it's by talking with us that things can be sorted out. We can also start identifying the early warning signs of losing control and coming and regulating behaviors, right? So all of this should be included in a safety plan. So I'm gonna give you an example about, you know, sometimes it takes a few trials and it takes it takes effort because you definitely need um need to you need you need to know a little bit your client or the person who you are serving in order to fill out um a trauma-informed safety plan. Um a few years ago. And you know, every time that I present her, I truly hope that I'm sending her good vibes and good healing energy. And I'm truly hoping that she's in a better place uh, now, uh, living a full life um, in, in a life that she deserves to live. Um, this student was an adolescent girl who was well known because she was an amazing fighter. Okay, but fighting, you know, could be interpreted as, you know, protecting herself um, and or could also be interpreted as, you know, uh, being a bully um, and, you know, being a troublemaker and many other things, depending on the environment that she was in. Um, you know, when I started trying to figure out what were her triggers? What, what were things that made her fight? Um, all that she could describe was, you know, the lack of respect. A person would look back, you know, to me, or, you know, he felt that, that this person was talking about me. She wouldn't confirm anything, but, you know, she was definitely walking with an alarm that was already activated. It was off and, you know, little reminders about mistreatment or about misunderstandings um, will trigger her alarm completely. And then, you know, when I was trying to identify early warning signs for her, she would tell me that she blacks, she would black out. So she, she couldn't recognize any early warning signs before she fought, right? And the more that I started talking to her, then she realized that, you know, all that she could feel before she engaged in a fight 
was that she felt butterflies in her stomach. And the minute that she could recognize that she felt butterflies in her stomach, I think that that was the minute that she started shifting a little bit of her behavior. Um, so many times when we create trauma-informed safety plans, you know, they are not like big revelations. There are sort of small steps that we take. And together, collaborating with the person who we serve, we can create something meaningful for them and something that they can really apply and they can really take home with them and every other place that they go to. Because I believe that this girl never forgot the connection that she had with her butterflies in her stomach before a fight. And as a matter of fact, she stopped fighting. Um, and she she used more her words in order to, you know, get some needed things that she she definitely some things that she needed and, and she also used her own words to protect other people um, around herself that were being abused or mistreated. So different things could happen when, when we pay attention to how our brain works and when we help people to also understand that. So when we talk about trauma reminders or triggers, we talk about things, we talk about events, we talk about situations, places, sensations, and even people that a youth or a person consciously or unconsciously connects with a traumatic event, okay? So these are so important to, um, to consider whenever we're talking, whenever we are, um, we are sort of walking, um, helping a person um, identify or, or learning a little bit more about how to, um, how to understand better her or his brain and her or his reactions, okay? And I'm gonna give you another example on this one. There are some triggers and some reminders that our body will sort of um, react towards, but we don't have a verbal memory about it. So, you know, if trauma happened to us very early in our lives, we might react towards it, but we don't have the words to express it, right? Because it's a non-verbal, right? It happened to us when we couldn't talk. So how can we really express this verbally, right? So when I was about two years old, the story comes that, you know, I was almost attacked by a German shepherd. And, and, and instead of attacking me, I'm, beating me, uh, this dog attacked my aunt, who really came and protected me. You know, until I was probably 10 or 11 years old, I never, I couldn't really come up with a good explanation why my, my whole body shook and I, my palms would, would sweat whenever I would look at dogs, right? And I told you, I, I was born in Peru and I was raised in Peru um, until I was 19 years old when I came to this country. And, you know, like there are street dogs. So every time that I had, I, I saw a street dog, I would cross the street because I, I didn't really want to even pass nearby the dog, right? That's how difficult it was for me to be around dogs. But, you know, I couldn't put the two and two together because I never knew about the story. I could only, I could only sort of sense that my body sensed danger. I didn't know why until years later when the story was told as a very funny story that, you know, in a, in a, a sort of family reunion, uh, remember when. So, you know, if I, then it makes sense to me that wow, you know, like it, this really happened to me, and now I now I know why I'm so afraid of dogs, right? So that was my first sort of connection that yes, I'm afraid of dogs because, you know, 
I could picture myself as a two-year-old, tiny, short, and this big German shepherd probably felt to me as a gigantic mos monster that was coming here in not as a friendly way, right? Um, so, you know, my amygdala then knew about this thing. So I could connect those two and I was able to a little bit ease out on the tension uh, whenever I was around dogs. So that was good for me to understand it, right? And to know what were my triggers. So yes, I'm afraid of dogs, but now I know why. And now I can see that not all dogs are mean. Um, and years later, when I came to this country, one of my first jobs was to deliver newspapers. So I don't know how many of you have delivered newspapers, but you know, you throw the newspaper or you leave it at the door. And um, on a sunny day, that day was sunny, <laughs> I throw the newspaper, I threw the newspaper out and all of a the sudden there is a dog that's coming at me, right? Jumping and barking and all of a sudden, a 20 year old woman, I'm screaming and I'm asking for my mom. Like I'm, I'm, I'm screaming, I'm like, mom. Um, so I went back to being that two-year-old that was afraid of the dog because it took me for by surprise. It was truly unexpected. And in my brain, there is a still that regis register, right? About dogs. Um, so, you know, this is something that I don't think is such a big trauma, but it was big for a two-year-old and it carried me on for many years. So I, I, I sort of, before the break, I was telling you about my stories about how dogs were big triggers for me and how even though when I thought that I already put the two uh, and two together, I still unexpectedly was triggered again, right? And um, and what I want to tell you is that you know that could happen and it will happen, but it doesn't tell take you. Your brain can regroup uh, much quicker because now um, the experience has been somehow somewhat processed, and that's the word that. Um, we continuously need to do with ourselves if we have been touched by trauma, but also with the people who we served, all right? Uh, so that's um, important to, to consider. Okay, so there are also loss reminders, and these loss reminders can be empty situations, shared activities, rituals, favorite activities, and and physical scars. Um, so, you know, reminders can take different shapes and, uh, and um, different ways, right? Um, I guess, you know, how I can identify empty situations, you know, many times um, for people who have, um, who had unexpectedly sort of good vibes um, or who had repetitively goodbyes with loved ones. Uh, you know, there are, sometimes there are like certain days of the week or certain days of a month that will bring those empty situations, those reminders. And sometimes you cannot really put, you cannot really consciously um, realize that that's what's happening. And that's why it's so important to identify them, right? Once we identify and name some of the reminders, then it takes less power. And then our amygdala has more information to keep on processing and to keep on helping us distinguish between what's a threat and what's uh, you know, a reminder from the past um, that we, we need to continuously process. And the same thing with all of the other ones that we listed. You know, with rituals, that's also another thing that, you know, the environment many times brings onto us, right? Like 
even in schools and in our own work context, we might celebrate some activities as, as rituals um, of festivities or things that can connect us. And, you know, and these are really good, um, good sort of get togethers for most of us, but also we need to be very mindful about that for some people that might not be, right? Like um, for children who have been separated from their parents, celebrating a Father's Day or Mother's Day might be, um, might be a reminder, might be a lost reminder. They're no longer with them, things of that nature. So just mm, being mindful of different situations. And that doesn't mean that we're going to start doing it or activities, but, you know, the more that we can contain and the more that we can talk and name, the less triggering uh, that it will be. So then we have hidden reminders, and these are maybe very difficult to identify, cause physical reactions without our being able to understand them, right? And past betrayals can make trust, affection, and connection become hidden reminders of pain. Important to remember that. So coming the survival brain, how do we come our survival brain? Youth affected by trauma may expect others to compromise their safety try to feel safe and protect themselves in ways that are risky, dangerous, or destructive. Or can learn new ways to feel safe from firm and caring adults who are aware of trauma reminders. Okay, that's important. And what can we do? We can list the actions an adult does to make you feel unsafe and activate their survival brain. We can also consider some ways you and your coworkers can avoid behaviors that make you feel unsafe, okay? And one of the most common ones that we often see is the power struggles, right? Many times in different contexts, uh, there is, there is potential possibilities that we sort of fall into this power struggle um, experiences. And that can really activate uh, anybody's survival brain, right? Um, in particular, uh, the youth survival brains. Um, so many times doing these safety plans, working proactively, it can really help to uh, deter from, you know, getting into these power struggles. And also, the more that we understand that there is a potential possibility, right? There is so the potential there to get into power struggles, how as adults, how we can control our own alarms, not to use our power to overpower the people who we served. So how youth respond to trauma, traumatic stress reactions, there are many different ways that people in general, right? Not only youth respond to trauma. By re-experiencing it, and that we understand as flashbacks, right? Avoiding hyperarousal or reactivity, negative alteration in cognition and mood, or sometimes dissociating, okay? So these are some of the ways. And if we see this, we're gonna explain here a little bit more. So when we're talking about re-experiencing symptoms, we talk about intrusive images, sensations or memories of the traumatic event that recurred uncontrollably. So we don't really intentionally, we don't want to remember those, but they just come to us, okay? So this includes nightmares, disturbing thoughts, flashbacks, 
physiological reactions, right? Our body sort of gets triggered and it starts um, bringing on bringing on the sort of responses that we don't know where they come from, and intense prolonged psychological distress. So, and I am gonna share, we are gonna share with you a list of vignettes that I hope that you have time to read, you know, one or maybe two, and hopefully we can discuss them tomorrow. And um and you will get copies or, or the link uh, today in the chat, in the chat. But here um, is actually you're gonna meet Kai and um, I'm gonna give you a little bit of, um, you know, what he's facing. Carrie's intrusive thoughts. Carrie is a young man who was shot by a robber who stole his gold chain and speaks about his assailant. And this is what he says. He says, I cannot get this dude out of my head. I see him every day, every day. Every night I see this dude and he's locked up. So this is a perfect but very sad example of an intrusive thought. And if you want to know more about Kerry's um, life, you can actually check um, him out in the vignettes, in the list of vignettes. I don't know if his entire uh, vignette is in the one that I gave you, but you will find similar uh, stories as Kerry in the ones that are going to be sharing the link. The other thing that he thinks about is no one is going to step to me like that ever again, right? So now his survival brain is talking and saying, no, I'm not going to allow this to happen anymore. And then, you know, that's where the risk starts increasing, right? Because next time that Kerry feels triggered, he might, he might take things into his own hands, right? So now, how youth respond to trauma avoidance symptoms, okay? So avoidance of internal reminders mm -hmm. of thoughts, feelings, or physical sensations. Avoidance of external reminders, we're talking about people, places, objects, activities, situations, conversations. Uh, sometimes we avoid discussing related issues, right? So, you know, it's important to distinguish these two, the internal reminders versus the external reminders, right? With the internal reminders, you know, sometimes the easy way to, to sort of um, associate these internal reminders and ways that we avoid it is, you know, uh, sometimes we associate it with the use of drugs or alcohol um, um, or taking very um, uh, high risk on doing things because all that um, the survival brain is trying to do is it's trying to avoid thinking, feeling, um, or, or sort of experiencing any physical uh, sensation about the trauma, okay? And uh, many times... It's so important to recognize these internal reminders because there are definitely, um, just like we can uh, use different types of coping skills, there are some coping skills that uh, we can categorize um, that are healthy coping skills versus some of them, the coping skills that might numb um, feelings or emotions, but my might actually uh, be very risky or might be very um, um, uh, might have negative uh, outcomes for for the person right um so the same thing with avoiding of external reminders um you know there are different sort of um different ways that it can really affect a person's function and a person's um, activities. Um, just when a person is overextending, you know, the avoidance um, of these external reminders, right? Because after all, um, we all humans, depending on what we do and depending our 
on our developmental stage, we are going to have to, uh, you know, uh, interact or or or, um, uh, or or be in different places that might be um, places that can be very triggering for us, right? So um, you will meet a student in one of the vignettes that we will share with you. Uh, that this student, she was trying desperately to avoid an external reminder and the external reminder was going to school. Um, and, and the reason why she desperately was trying to avoid going to school was because, you know, her stepdad will take her out to sexually abuse her, right? So, so there are definitely things that, um, that unfortunately happened and, you know, our survival brain is acting in the way that it needs to because it's des desperately trying to protect um, you, right? Um, so when it comes to be detrimental is obviously when this poor child did not, um, nobody knew about this and she couldn't be protected. Uh, you know, um, the school uh, obviously was not aware of what was happening. Um, and, you know, it was actually an experience of present and current trauma. Um, and, and her amygdala was super reacting towards something that was happening, right? So it was really trying to protect her desperately. Um, but in other instances, when the trauma is no longer there, you know, a child might still um, be triggered and avoid this environment because of all the reminders that this person has still with her. So let's see now. So how youth respond to trauma when we talk about alterations in arousal and reactivity we talk about behaviors that are irritable or aggressive. We also talk about um, self-destructive or reckless behavior, um, the startling, quick startling or jumpiness, problems with concentration, sleep disturbance, hyperarousal or hypervigilance. So all of these are examples of alterations in arousal and reactivity. And as, as you could, Tell, you know, this comes from a, a brain that is trying in a survival mode. Now, how you respond to trauma when we talk about negative alterations in cognition and mood? We are, these are some of the examples. We talk about the inability to remember parts of traumatic events, uh, persistently experience negative emotions. Um, persistently uh, experiencing um, lack of um, positive emotions, uh, decrease of interest or participation in activities, feeling detached from others, persistent exaggerated negative expectations, and persistent distorted blame of self or others. Okay, so these are how, um, you know, how, Trauma really affects the way that we could um, we could actually uh, use our cognitions and mood in order to continue living the lives that we all deserve to live, right? So um, I can give you some examples of that in terms of negative alterations in cognition and mood. I used to run a women's diversion program a while ago. And I think that we formed a very good connection with many of the women that were in the program and they were from different ages, from late teens to, to women who were in their fifties or uh, close to their sixties. And um, I, I would say that it was a, a, um, a safe community. And there was a, a brilliant um, young woman who was part of the, the, the group and she was doing well. I mean, everything was really working out. She was 
come into treatment, she stopped using drugs, um, she engaged, she, she registered to be, um, to continue her studies, she was going to a community college, her professors like her, you know, she, she loved to write poems and, and her professor really, you know, like encouraged her for her to write more. And one day she comes to the groups and she's, she's sitting there and sharing and she's telling all of us, you know, something is gonna go wrong here. Something, something really bad is gonna happen. And, um, and that something really bad that was gonna happen was her amygdala going off and she realizing that there were a lot of things that were really happening for her. And obviously it, it was because of her hard work, but the negative alterations in cognitions were there for her that day, right? So, um, so we need to be very mindful that sometimes when things are going right, that's when um, we need to pay more attention and, and continue processing uh, um, and helping um, people to, to realize that part of, part of the ongoing sort of um, growth is to understand how negative alterations in cognition will, will seep in from time to time. So we are meeting here Ian, and, and um, Ian is gonna share with us a little bit about his numbing experience. So, and we label this as Ian loses his, loses his fear. And that this is what he says. So a lot of things that made me scared or made me nervous, they don't scare me no more. They don't affect me. Like if a whole bunch of dudes kept on looking at me, I used to feel nervous. And if someone kept on like giving me mean looks, I used to get nervous. It don't happen no more. It's like some of the feeling is just gone. If they look at me now, I look at them right back, like what, right? So Jan has learned how to keep on protecting himself and now, you know, numbing is, is a coping skill, a coping mechanism that is helping him to get through what he's going through right now. Unfortunately, there are, um, you know, if it keeps on sticking this numbing coping mechanism into many other parts of his life, then that's when the real problem begins for him, right? So how youth respond to trauma when, um, and what are the examples um, with dissociation? The examples of dissociation um, are several, and here are some. Feeling unreal and disconnected from self, mentally separating the self from the experience, may experience the self as detached from the body, on the ceiling or somewhere else in the room, and may feel as if in a dream or unreal state. So all of these are examples of dissociation, okay? Now, we talk about rates of trauma and PTSD in the juvenile justice um, youth, but I also want you to keep on thinking in the people, in the group of people who you are serving, okay? So we mentioned before that 90% of juvenile offenders reported at least one or more traumatic experiences and on average reporting at least six. Youth in the juvenile justice population, and we're talking about the US, have rates of PTSD comparable to those of service members returning from Iraq, right? So from war. And 40% of youth with trauma history are diagnosed with at least one other mood, anxiety, or disruptive behavior disorder. So all of these stats are good reference for us in order to know what we need to do. So as I mentioned before, I just, if you know the race um, 
and of PTSD in your community, you can share it in the chat. So understanding trauma and preventing reoffending, um, and we can also say understanding trauma and preventing, you know, um, relapsing in some way um, is when we identify trauma, um, we can improve risk assessment for further offending and lead, and lead to rehabilitative services that work. Right. So many times we when we know what's happening, then this is what's going to help us to um, to bring services that make a click for the people who we are serving and may prevent them from uh, reoffending or, or relapsing or, you know, um, or or also um um, going back to similar behaviors as they were uh, experiencing before. So here is when we also need to consider the risk, determining the likelihood for reoffending and type of services that will rehabilitate is important. If we're talking with, if we're working with populations um, um, in the criminal justice system, uh, we also need to assess for need targeting provision of services that are matched to a specific risk for reoffending using effective and proven tools and responsivity. Youth ability to rehabilitate is maximized by tailoring services to youth needs and strengths. And that's part of, you know, the empowerment piece that SAMHSA talks about the six trauma-informed um, uh, tools for uh, for systems, right? Um, so understanding trauma and preventing re-traumatizing. Re um, when we talk about this, we're talking about identifying trauma uh, can improve risk assessment for further exposure to more trauma and lead to rehabilitative services that work. And that's also important. So, um, and I already shared this with you, and I'm going to talk a little bit about mental health disorders' role in responding to trauma. So, when we talk about the type of mental health disorders and the percentages with mental health diagnosis, we understand that disruptive disorders such as conduct disorders are 46.5% um, um, in, in the population of juvenile uh, justice uh, youth. Um, we also identify that 46% uh, endorse substance use disorders, also 34.4% endorse anxiety disorders and 18.3% endorse mood disorders. So the question for us is, what are barriers to working with mental health professionals and communicating with them about youth? And what improves working with mental health professionals and helps communication with them about youth, right? So what are the barriers and what are the things that are really working and all the things that we can improve? Um, and I'm not quite sure if you would like to add some things in the chat, please feel welcome to. I think that what I could say is that, you know, sometimes one big barrier is that um, definitely um, different services do work in isolation, right? And we don't really have opportunities to integrate services. And so many services that the youth or a person can be, um, can, can have, if they don't talk to one another, everybody's doing something different, right? Or maybe something of the same, but not, not in, in, in any sort of um, collaborative effort or in any, um, in, 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 in not in, in synchronicity, 
that can be um, can can be less effective in the long run. Um, and you know, I think that that's one of the the biggest challenges and barriers. Another thing is that because there are different services that one person is receiving, chances are that everybody knows one part of the puzzle, but no, no services know close to the whole puzzle, right? So, so that's also another sort of um, uh, handicap for us, because if we don't understand the person um, completely or wholly, then the services are going to be patchy. They're going to be just, um, in, 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 they're gonna, they're gonna not serve a person um, in, 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 in the best way possible. So, and then one of the pieces that I had seen whenever it works is that when services get together, you know, people have the necessary information to make appropriate treatment plans to sort of share uh, the different sort of activities and treatment modalities that a person can receive. And the more coordination, the better resource that you can have. And the less burden for, you know, each system that works um, in ILO or silos, right? So, so those are some of the things that we can all um, take in, into consideration whenever we're working with uh, people who unfortunately have been highly traumatized and they definitely need coordinated services in order to make, um, um, to, to, to make the best outcomes, right? So let's see. These are um, the vignettes that we are sharing for tomorrow. And you are going to meet uh, some of them. So there are six vignettes. I'm not expecting you to read all of them. But if you read one or two, and then potentially we can have tomorrow breakout rooms where you can discuss what you had um, read. And also, um, you know, at this time, we will be covering more of the, much of the information from, uh, from this training. And hopefully um, you can um, integrate um, the discussions that we have here into uh, the vignettes that you will read. And when we talk about vignettes, you know, there are several professionals here who have put together these stories from their real practices, but obviously for um, confidentiality purposes, um, there, there might be stories that are blended, right? And when we discuss tomorrow the vignettes, we want you to think about what are the traumatic experiences and or losses that um, a child experience? What are the traumatic reactions that this child might um, exhibit? And what could be potential trauma, trauma reminders? So those would be three questions that I hope that you could answer in the small groups that we're gonna prepare for tomorrow. Um, and you know, there are also going to be a few more questions um, that I hope that you have time to do in small groups. So when we talk about identifying resilience, I'm gonna show you here a video and then we're going to discuss this a little bit. Now, I hope that my setting is still the same, so I'm gonna try to do it. Can you all hear? It's June in San Francisco, and Patrick Willis is on his way to see his new $5 million home. Today, you know, I'm going over there for the first time. <laughs> it's like waking up for Christmas, you know. You, it's, um, I don't know, I got, like, butterflies and all that. 
in the house that I grew up in, um, you know, it was a roof over our heads, but at the same time, too, you know, when it rained, it, it poured, and that's that was literal. The six foot one, 240 pound Willis is arguably the best linebacker in football. At 26 years old, he's made four Pro Bowls in four NFL seasons. He can be from point A to point B in a flash. He can startle players. You know, you see it in their eyes. How in the heck did he get me? But Patrick Willis's success is grounded in something deeper, more complex. A childhood filled with disappointment and anger that forced him to grow up too fast. Well, he's a guy that has every reason to quit. The guy that has every reason to hate everybody. Greatness is not about the guy that has all the skill and the talent. Greatness is measured by the setbacks that you've had in life. Have you been able to fight through them and become stronger? Deep in the backwoods of Brewston, Tennessee, two hours east of Memphis, there was a double wide trailer at the end of a dirt path, Patrick's childhood home. What I had is what they call country strength. It's from growing up in the country and just doing abnormal things like chopping wood. I didn't get running water until I was eight years old. So we literally had to use the bathroom and buckets in nighttime, put a um, board over it and whatnot. The next morning, had to take it out down in the woods and get rid of it. Patrick was four when his mother abandoned him and his three younger siblings. They lived with their father, Ernest, a part-time logger. I tried to teach them the way I was taught, you know. I let them know, try to let them know what's right and wrong and try to learn them the right way. My dad wanted us to be together because he knew how, how, how important my family is and he knew how important we were to each other. In 1995, at age 10, Patrick was helping his father support the family. That summer, he began working full-time in the cotton fields to help pay the bills. I'm like, here you go, Dad. Like, here goes some, I like, give him like, like $60 of what I had, you know, or $50 or something, but just something, you know. And he would come at me like, I might forget $20, the light bill do. But then I never know why I would suddenly come home and the, the light's not on. He always was spending money on alcohol and, and drugs or whatnot. What kind of drugs was he doing? I, I, I don't know what type of drug it was. Like, specifically, I just know that whatever it was, it had a metal pipe and plastic wrapped around the end of the metal pipe. I drank me beer and stuff. I used to smoke a little marijuana back in the day, but I don't know more. But it wasn't no abuse and thing, you know, it wasn't no big thing. He would come out asking all paranoid and asking a thousand questions, and we like, like, man, come on, Pops, like, like, uh, but you know, but we didn't say nothing. We just kept our cool, act like we didn't know what was going on. But Patrick says there was more going on at home than just drug use. He just got really, really abusive. He had a tendency going too far. I mean, you can get a whooping. But it is, a, it is a part when you overdo a whooping. <laughs> Getting hit with pots and pans turned into fists. Because our dad used to say, like, we ain't little no more, so he'll fight us. I, mean, I got a little switch, a belt or something, I was spanking with my hand, you know. You know. But, you know, it wasn't no, wasn't no killing thing. It just something to make them, let them know what they done wrong, you know. So crazy abusive that I just started looking at him like, like a stranger. This is where you... We used to, to hang out and start learning your skills. All right, man, this right here, believe it or not, like, this right here is where the game of football it all started for me. Like, I couldn't afford to play peewee football. Down here, where this, where this pole is, right here, that was, that was one touchdown. Patrick immersed himself in sports. He became a star in baseball, basketball, and football at Brewston Central High School. I'd rather be playing sports than to be home, like, any day. That was, like, my escape. And I just got to the point to where, as long as I don't feel, that I'm fine. Back home, with his father increasingly unreliable, 
Patrick found himself in a different role, head of the household. Patrick was there. He, like, he helped us make sure we got our homework done and stuff like that. We knew that if we didn't get our chores and stuff cleaned up, that it's going to be consequences. He's just like a father figure to us. On a spring day in 2001, during a family basketball game, Patrick, then 17, made a decision that would change his family forever. Our dad is so competitive, like, if we lost, if we was on his team, we got a whooping for it. It was the game-winning point when Patrick went up to make the shot. Patrick elbowed me, so, you know, I covered my mouth. And Patrick, he all happy because he just dunked on me. So I giggled, too, and our dad was like, it ain't funny. The next thing you know, I saw him like hit me all in the face and the head. I'm like, this is it. This is the day that me and my dad are about to, like, fight. Because nobody's ever stood up to my dad. I didn't hit her hard, you know, I just, you know, you know, she, she tried, got mad and trying to fight, you know, and I, I just, I, yeah, but I whipped the butt. And he got ready to grab my head again, and I ran, I grabbed his hand, i never forget, I grabbed his arm and just stopped completely. And then what happened? Then he looked back at me and he was like, boy, if you ever get in between my business again, like this here, I'd kill you. That night, Patrick, his two brothers and sister decided to finally tell school counselors about the years of abuse. I felt like something crazy was going to eventually happen. Like, nothing good was going to come out of us, like, staying there. I felt like it was my job to protect them. A week later, the Department of Children's Services sent police to the Willis home. You know, I asked, I asked what's going on here. I asked, I asked, you know, I cussing. You know, I asked what the hell, you know, I did. I said, what's, what's going on, you know? I said, and he said, well, we come to get your kids. I said, for what? I whooped him, but I ain't abused him. Ernest Willis was never charged with any crimes. Still, authorities planned to move his four children into separate foster homes across the state. Word reached Patrick's high school. Superintendent came down to my classroom in the hallway and he pulled me out of class and he wanted to know if my wife and I would be interested in taking all four kids in because they didn't want to split the kids up. I said, well, yeah, I mean, yeah, we can, we should, we can help them. <laughs> and of course, everybody at the time was like, you don't have a clue what you're doing. Four teenagers, you know, what are you thinking? In the summer of 2002, before his senior year of high school, Patrick, along with his younger brothers and sister, moved in with the Finleys. I felt like for the first time in my life, I could, I could be a kid. I could wake up, brush my teeth, and have hot water, and maybe possibly, like, have a girlfriend or something, because I wouldn't be ashamed to, like, bring them home. We'd give them an allowance for doing, you know, whatever little chores they had. I can remember Patrick, he would come to us and say, well, do you need any of this for, like, the light bill? And I was like, no, you know, that's your money. You know, you can keep it. You know, he didn't have to worry about basic need kind of things. I think he could concentrate on himself more and, and what he needed to do. As a high school senior, Patrick was nominated for the state's Mr. Football Award on both offense and defense a first for any athlete in Tennessee. In 2003, at the University of Mississippi, he started all 13 games as a freshman and became a two-time All-American, at times playing with a broken hand, sprained knee, sprained foot, and separated shoulder. Every time I saw him, he had a cast on his ankle, he had a cast on his forearm. <laughs> Wait, what's up with this guy? when I heard his story, I was like, wow, I'm impressed. We, we got to get this kid. The San Francisco 49ers selected Patrick Willis with the 11th pick in the 2007 draft. At 22 years old, Willis had almost everything he ever dreamed of, except for a relationship with his father. I would just tell him, I want to be able to have a relationship with you. I can help you if you need money for it lights and, and, and grocery the food or something that you're taking it and you spending it on drugs. He literally pulled out a pocket knife. He said, Pat, you better get away from me. Ain't nobody, like, nobody doing nothing. Now, I told you I wouldn't. I wasn't doing no drugs. He come through the front door and his eyes were just red, you know, and I knew he'd been crying. It was the only time I've ever seen him emotional or kind of broken-spirited and upset, ever. He wanted to help his dad so bad. And uh, I think he was emotional because he wanted his dad to help himself, you know? 
Sorry. Um. When you have a, a tough childhood, it makes the tough things very normal. You know that I've been through this. I can handle the rest. This is just a game. It's also a job, and Patrick works hard at it, just like he's worked hard at everything in his life. In each of his first four seasons with the 49ers, he's made at least 100 tackles. In May of 2010, he earned a five-year, $50 million contract extension. Last October, he bought his first house. I've been dreaming of getting a house like this since I was a kid. So the house is beautiful, <laughs> but um, for um, in terms of time, we're just gonna go. And I'm wondering if if um, if you feel okay, just telling me your reactions, okay? Um, so one of the things that mm, this is the first time I'm, I'm going to talk about this, you know because we are talking about environment, right? And there are many different factors that are impacting uh, Patrick's family life, right? And, um, you know, a few years ago, you know, like a, a few years ago, we still were talking about, you know, how terrible the father was and the mother for abandoning the, the children, right? So sometimes when trauma, happens um and we cannot really explain things logically then you know trauma sometimes raises also our own alarm when we hear stories that are very difficult to digest and somehow somewhat sometimes we will go and, and try to figure out who is the one who is the perpetrator or who is the who is the 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 accuser? Right? Who is the the person responsible for it? And definitely, there are there are sort of adults that need to be responsible, right? Like like this dad and this mom, who um, who unfortunately, you know, we don't really um, consider sometimes in our conversations or discussions. But I I believe that strongly that Patrick's parents were also victims of their own childhood abuse, right? And, and that probably it happens, it happened intergenerationally, right? So the great-grandparents and the grandparents and so on and so on. And um, so, you know, not to justify behaviors because we are not here to justify abuse, but to also, just as we are understanding how trauma impacts behavior in children, you know, we can also figure out ways to, to understand how trauma impacts the behavior of parents, of adults who have not been rich, right? I mean, if you think about this father, this father lived in very difficult conditions, poverty was real. And you know, when we talk about poverty, we talk about different degrees of poverty. But you saw where, you know, Patrick and, and his siblings and, and his dad were living, and it was a real sense of poverty there that also impacted, and that was environment environmental. And here is, is a dad who I would guess probably he didn't have any support whatsoever, right? Um, and 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 yes, he he did things that were not appropriate, and you know the kids needed to be removed, um, and you know this dad also needed help, um, and unfortunately uh, was not um, was not available. Right. So these are some of the things that we need to environmentally we need to consider whenever we are also, um, you know, um, thinking about uh, or dealing with similar situations. And um, 
And every time that I play this video, I see different things. Um, and I also, you know, also hear the different reactions that people have from watching the same thing. And long time ago, there was a, um, a woman of color who reached out to me and, and what she wanted to tell me was that it was very sad the way that Patrick's um, dad was portrayed. Um, you know, like, and, and I, I definitely, up to that point, I didn't really, I didn't really make the connection, but as, as, as soon as she pointed it out to me, I was um, also taken by it. And now I have made a point to just um, talk about this because obviously we don't have all the solutions and we don't have all the pieces to put together. And at the same time, you know, I think that we have more information now that can help us to, to attempt to see the bigger picture. And if I would have the opportunity to, to connect with Patrick, these are some of the things that I would tell him, right? Um, from what I have followed up in his story, you know, after many years, he was able to reconnect with his dad, um, but he did not want to reconnect with his mom. And he also lost um, a sibling. Um, one of his siblings um, drowned. And, you know, it was really hard for him, but he was the one that put the whole family together again, right? He was, um, he was able to be there for, for his siblings and, 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 uh, um, and overcome that big loss. So, so here are the questions. What childhood adversity were portrayed in this clip? Okay. And what contributed to his resilience? And Karen, I'm not quite sure if I'm, I have some uh, comments in the chat. Yes, you have a few. And mm -hmm. um, the definitely people agreed with the theme of the generational trauma mm -hmm. and, um, and that how that passed through. And then also um, poverty. Mm -hmm. um, disengaged boundaries and messed boundaries with family. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. Physical, emotional abuse, abandonment, substance abuse, neglect, mm -hmm. moving, uh, loss of a parent. Mm -hmm. Just some of the things that have come in so far. Thank you, thank you. So, and these are really important um, comments and I really appreciate you sending them. Um, and I guess it must be difficult for us to see any positivity in what we saw in Patrick's upbringing, right? Definitely his father was struggling um, and how Patrick and, um, his uh, sister described it, it was really uh, difficult, right? To even to hear. And, but I wonder if there is anything that you can think of that can be rescued um, from what um, Patrick's father was able to, to, to provide, if there is anything that you can think of. And maybe, you know, we can check the chat. In a little bit. All right. So when we talk about resiliency, um, we need to figure out how we understand resilience and how we manage challenges. Okay. So here are some of the assets. You know, self-efficacy is important, right? And Patrick really showed that. His self-esteem was really good. When it came to sports, he said that he was good at many things, right? And that made him feel special and probably his whole environment also appreciated. So that was sort of, he contributed to building his self-esteem and his sense of self-efficacy at the same time. And again, this competence, you know, he was very good at what he did. And that really, 
or sort of had to really add to his sense of competence, right? I'm not quite sure about his spiritual belief, but that's another asset that we can see in, in the people who we served. That could be a good uh, asset to check um, carefully, right? Carefully because sometimes the spiritual belief might not be considered an asset depending on the experience of a person. So, and the resources we talk about, we need to know more about the family support, you know, what types of peer support this person has, the community connections and the school connectedness. And all of these really contribute to the sense of resiliency that a person um, might experience, okay? So in terms of family support for Patrick, I think that, you know, his siblings and him really got each other, right? They, they really were connected. They were really, they were taking care of each other. And Patrick was there for, for his younger siblings. Uh, with, in terms of peer support, I think that, you know, just because of all the things that we have heard, you know, it seemed that people look up to Patrick and his peers were looking up to him because of all the uh, amazing strengths that he sh shown, right? And I'm sure that he was also likable as, as, a, as a student, as a person. And so, you know, we talk about school connectedness and, you know, his coach opening the doors for his whole family, that was truly impressive. And that talks about that connection. Um, and, you know, obviously the community connection because the school was also um, part of the community. Um, so I want you to think about what is specific assets or resources do you think support youth who have experienced trauma? What are some things, um, what are specific assets or resources um, do you think support youth who have experienced trauma in your own communities? Okay. Karen, do we have anything in the chat? You know, I think as it pertains to the story, um, uh -huh. coaches, teammates, sports, um, the 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 people that his foster parents and the love that mm -hmm. they showed, um, organizations like boys and girls clubs, um, out of school time engagement, positive youth development, um, perfect, and faith the faith that that the his school had in him mm -hmm. and came out to help him. Wonderful, wonderful, excellent. So. I also want to say that, you know, um, I show you this Freedom Writers uh, movie. And if we think about that particular community, you know, and we think about how they started building their own resiliency, um, it was through this teacher who, uh, that these uh, students who came from the same community but had different sort of practices and beliefs. And uh, some of them were from different cultural backgrounds, you know, and some of them belonged to different gangs. They all came together and they formed like a very good peer community as well. And that really helped them, helped them to, you know, continue with their educational goals, helped them to graduate from high school, help them to engage in activities that were meaningful. Um, you know, they were able to go on trip fields of that um, they would never imagine that uh, they could possibly go as a group. So they went to the Holocaust Museum. They brought a guest speaker from Europe to talk to them. So different things, positive things happen and it, they truly build their individual resiliency, but also their group resiliency, and ultimately their community resiliency. Um, and that was truly impressive. Um, and, you know, we can appreciate what happens in our own communities, 
and how this um, resiliency continues being built uh, in, in the small activities that one can do. So one example that I also have from um, another country from Venezuela, you know, here this was a, a guy who is no longer with us, but he created um, a, a system, an orchestra system in Venezuela, where he went to the most marginalized community in the country. And unfortunately, Venezuela is actually struggling a lot, right? And he actually developed this whole system about um, little kids learning how to play instruments uh, for, to be part of our orchestra. And um, it has been very successful and it has been established uh, many years ago. There, there is, um, and people, um, you know, famous, renowned people, now are in orchestras in, in the world. Uh, and they came from, from this, um, this movement, I will call it a movement. And when you, um, when you interview some of the students, the trauma has not stopped in their lives, right? There was um, one interview that really touched my heart of one, um, I would say maybe 12 or 13 year old girl who was interviewed and she was telling uh, the interviewer that she was on the day of her audition, she was really getting ready to be, to go, hoping that they would take her. Um, and she was shot walking from her community to this place, she was shot. And, um, and that she wasn't upset because of the shooting. She was upset because she was gonna lose her audition, her opportunity to be part of this orchestra. And, you know, what, I mean, fortunately for her, she made it through. And now she's telling us her story um, and how she, much she enjoys being part of that community, right? Where she has peers who like to do the same thing that she does. Um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's an amazing way to spend your um, extra time. And, and, you know, there are opportunities for these kids to uh, engage in music, uh, create music, develop music, can be very soothing. It's wonderful for the amygdala. So there are many different ways where different communities organize themselves and maybe we cannot eradicate trauma because unfortunately, you know, we just need to hear the news for 30 seconds and there is something traumatic that is already happening. But we can create these opportunities for kids and adults um, that can really be meaningful and have bring us purpose and continue helping us to build resiliency so we can continue living the lives that we all deserve to live. So when we reveal beyond survival, we think about youth whose functioning declines due to trauma, exposure, and who can recover when giving opportunities to reveal their lives, right? So that's something important. Um, and what we can do is some, these are some of the things, not to take their behavior personally, let them know it is okay to feel upsetting feelings. That's okay, right? We all will have them. Help translate their behavior into feelings and words they can express in a healthy way. Work with them to reduce or avoid unnecessary reminders. And invite youth to share what is most frustrating about stressful situations and brainstorm healthy ways to deal with it that addresses it directly, okay? So what are things you can do or say to help youth feel safe? That's the question for all of us. 
what are some of the things that we can all do or say to help youth feel safe? Maybe that can be something that we can share in the chat. And Karen, if there is something there, you can read it. Sure. So there's um, music, like sports, creates perseverance and resiliency. Mm -hmm. um, the story behind the story behavior, um, validating people's feelings and experiences. So wonderful ones. Yes, definitely, definitely. Listening. Wonderful. Excellent. Listening is also very important. And as we mentioned that, you know, we process trauma through our senses, the senses come to us and our brain processes it, right? Now we can also utilize our senses to help our amygdala, right? And to help the other parts of our brain and our body. So many times, and, and that is almost like, we help people to rediscover what maybe one time it worked. And, you know, uh, because of many different things that happen in our life, we stop doing it, right? So, you know, um, we all know that exercise is very helpful. It helps us to, um, to, to increase some um, sort of, sort of some en endorphins in our bodies and our brain. Um, but you know, sometimes sometimes we are rushing, sometimes there is so many things that we are doing that we put that on the back burner, right? So sort of trying to figure out how we we squeeze time to do things that can be can be activities that can be coming and soothing. Uh, and it can help with our overall um, functionality of our brain and our bodies. That's extremely important. So a little bit of exercise, you know, the listening to music, that's also super. Um, and depending on what type of music, that's what I ask sometimes um, um, the youth that I work with. You know, I want, I want the music um, that can help them with... Uh, to calm themselves, to, to soothe their alarm center, to inspire them. So, and you know, they they definitely can have time to do, to listen to any type of music. But when I want their alarms to, um, to come down a, a bit, what I would like for them to do and practice is, um, is a specific type of music that will help with that. You know, how you use taste, how you use um, your other senses like seeing, you know, sometimes I recommend um, youth to, to or adults to put something in their room that can be soothing or can be inspirational. And when they open their eyes, that's the first thing that they're gonna see, right? So it can be a mantra, it can be a, a nice picture, it, it can be, whatever they they consider that is important for them and it's actually it gives them meaning and it gives them purpose um so so those are little things that do not take so long and do not cost anything that can be very helpful if we all practice this um at ongoing basis throughout our day so it cannot be one time per month. It has to be constantly, it has to be, you know, um, repetitively uh, in, in, you know, the more that we practice, the better that we get at it. So that's important to consider. So these are the take home messages. Trauma affects, affects behavior. Resilience and recovery are very possible and we all can make a difference. All right, so we are ready to continue. Yes, and I will encourage you, if you have any questions, any comments, you know, at the end of this uh, presentation and at the end of today, we're gonna meet with the team. So uh, 
We are happy to hear any uh, recommendations, comments, any questions that you have, and I will definitely, we will make sure to address them um, tomorrow, okay? So I definitely want this to be meaningful to you, and I definitely want to make sure that, um, that you know, that you can learn something <laughs> from, from, from your time investment. So, um, so please feel free to write down in the chat or um, I believe that you have a, a, the email um, and you can send whatever um, uh, comments or recommendations or questions that, 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 that you would like us to address. Okay, thank you. So we're going to talk we are going to continue to talk and focus about um, the intersection between trauma and the environment. And again, this um, this presentation is a compile of many different um, curriculums and other presentations. We are going to address more radical healing and clinical consideration in this part. Right. So here our learning objectives is to describe the impact of traumatic events and adverse childhood experiences on youth expectations, describe challenges, um, trauma impacted youth face related to the social contract, biases and systems they navigate, identify the practice components of a trauma informed practice and use knowledge to support policy changes and describe the role of radical healing in treatment and policy. So I'm going to start by defining what is radical healing. Um, the definition that I like is being or becoming whole in the face of identity-based wounds, which are the injuries sustained because of our membership in an oppressed racial or ethnic group. Wounds also include the ways in which our parents and their parents were harmed and traumatized by racist policies and practices, such as being denied the right to vote, being forced to attend assimilation schools, or being denied citizenship. Okay, and this is really important. I think that, you know, I went, I told you that I went to school here and I did all my undergraduate and graduate school in here. And I have been practicing psychology for the almost, I would say almost two decades. And, um, you know, it's just recent that we are talking about this, right? Racial trauma, identity-based wounds, something that has been with us for generations and Right now, just recently, we're giving them names. We are sort of speaking up. And that's, to me, I'm, I'm grateful. Um, I'm also sad that it has taken this long. And, um, but I'm hopeful that now we are going to bring services that resonate with, with our communities. And, um, and, and that really gives me a lot of hope. So what when I like radical healing because it actually addresses, you know, the deep ones that our ancestor experience, including broken treaties, stolen lands, enslavement, colonization, exploitation, internment camps, and the attempted erasure of these histories from public memory. Okay, so all of these things that um, are sort of intergenerational traumas that um, we have excluded for a long time in psychology and other fields uh, and in our practices are things that, you know, now they're coming back and that there are, uh, hopefully, we can integrate in the things that we do to serve the people and communities. So one example of this is, uh, you know, the, the terrible sort of tragedy experience of Khalif brother. I don't know how many of you 
ahead of him. Uh, Bacalif brother was an African-American youth from the Bronx, New York, who was held at the Rikers Island Jail Complex without trial between 2010 and 2013 for allegedly stealing a backpack containing valuables. And two years after his release, Khalif hung himself at his parents' home. And I want you to, I want you to, um, to share this uh, interview with him. Um, I, I'm not sure if, if you have uh, heard of him, but um, I just wanted to share with you to bring more awareness and also a little bit more um, discussion about identity words. And I hope that this works. I will just share it with you otherwise. It's Browner was arrested at 16. We never convicted of a crime right. How about now? trial. Yes, but we can more than three okay. years in one of the most violent jails in the country. Tonight, here is Khalif in his own words. You're supposed, you're supposed to be innocent until proven guilty, but the way the system is, is you're guilty till proven innocent. Little did we know Khalif Browder was already dying inside the day we met him. At the easy age of 22, he'd already learned more about America's criminal justice system and endured more than any soul should ever have to. That's Khalif there on the floor inside Rikers Island, New York City's most notorious jail, beaten by a gang of fellow inmates all caught on camera. At the age of 16, he was arrested and sent here for allegedly stealing a backpack. It was like hell on earth. We were beaten, stomped, by the, by the correction officers, and they was just beating on me. They was just beating on me. Beatings captured on surveillance video obtained by the New Yorker magazine, which first brought Khalif's story to light. In this video, we see him being escorted to the prison shower. He appears to speak to the guard, who in seconds is seen slamming him into a wall and then to the ground. And I cry myself to sleep because it's like, I want to go home, and it's like, they're not letting me go home. To go home, Khalif's mother, Vanita Browder, needed to post bail of $3,000, money she said she just didn't have. What was your reaction when you heard that your 16-year-old boy was being sent to Rikers Island? My heart dropped. You know, I had heard so many horror stories about Rikers, and all I could picture was him getting hurt in there. Court records show Khalif had attempted suicide at least six times, spent 1,110 days behind bars, more than 800 of those in solitary confinement. His court date postponed more than 30 times. He endured all this having never been given a trial, never convicted of a crime. Finally, in June of 2013, all charges against Khalif were dismissed. But his experience exposed a troubled criminal justice system and the brutality of life behind bars. I think at some point, almost a reckless disregard by the prosecutors in this case. They didn't care, Byron. They saw his file. They saw that he was in jail and he'd probably take a plea, and they were hoping he'd take a plea. They just told me that if I plead guilty, I would release from jail that same day, but I didn't do it. You're not gonna make me say I did something just so I could go home. When we first met him November of last year, he was doing better, he said. Earned his GED, started classes at Bronx Community College, pulling a 3.56 GPA. But the psychological trauma from jail had taken its toll. And when he first came home, he would just walk the four corners of the driveway. You hear animals do that have been confined to a space. Yes, he did it. And I had to watch my baby go through all of that. In the last year, Khalif grew depressed, deeply paranoid. You know, deep down, I'm a mess. I feel like I'm a grown old man. And then two Saturdays ago, two years after his release from jail, Khalif Browder hanged himself with an air conditioner cord in his home in the Bronx. He was 22. I didn't know what to do. I, can you imagine finding your son and he's hanging with his head back? Khalif's death made national news and messages of outrage mixed with sympathy flooded social media. John Legend wrote in an op-ed that New York failed Khalif. Lena Dunham Instagrammed his photo and called for reform. Our interview with Khalif went viral on Facebook. What we now know is that Khalif was due in court to face new charges of disorderly conduct the week he took his own life. His family said he was scared to go back into jail. By now, the beatings he endured in Rikers had been seen millions of times online. 
What did Rikers do to your son? It destroyed him. It destroyed him mentally. Has anyone apologized to you from Rikers? No. From the prosecutor's office? No. What do you hope happens now? I want them to be responsible, to admit that it was their fault that my son is dead. He spent three years in, in hell. It sounds like you're in that hell now. I will be in hell until the day I die because I found my son hanging. If your child is murdered, you, you have a, an immediate anger towards that person and you want that person found, you know, and, and pay for what they did to your child. It's not one person, it's a whole system that destroyed my son. And I want them all to pay. And I deeply wish we hadn't lost him, but he did not die in vain. New York did away with solitary confinement for 16 and 17 year olds. Plans were announced to fix crowded dockets in courts to ensure the right to a speedy trial. There are also calls for change to the cash bail system. Currently, only 12% of defendants in New York City make bail. We're in a quest for justice right now, Byron. Paul Prestia, who helped Khalif file his civil suit against the city, says it's not enough. Reform's all nice and well, but admit you did something wrong here, because that was always Khalif's message. How many young men have to go through this? 99% of the critics that talk all that junk, I promise you, they wouldn't have the courage to do the job that the correction officers do. Bernie Carrick knows the system from both sides. The former chief of the New York City Police Department, he also ran Rikers Island for years. And as a convicted felon, he spent time in solitary confinement. As someone that spent 60 days inside solitary confinement, it creates paranoia. It makes you insane. But he cautions the city against bowing to public pressure and implementing changes, he says, that could put Rikers correction officers and inmates in danger. If you take solitary confinement away from the correction officials, you're going to see a major, major increase in violence. These are kids that come from gangs. These are kids that ran the streets. I think is very dangerous. So what would you do? What, what were I your think, suggestions to improve think, Rikers Island? I think you keep that. You charge the staff that violate the law, and they're locked up. It's not hard to imagine the life he might have led if he had made it. I have the medal hanging on my bed. You see it in the remnants of the life and the people he left behind like Elizabeth Pyams, a program director at Bronx Community College who worked closely with Khalif. Granted his associate's degree. She says she's working on getting Khalif his associate degree posthumously. It's for you. Thank you so much. <laughs> what do you want the world to remember of your son? To remember him for the stand-up person that he was. He was a good person. The kind of person who turned down a plea bargain on principle, whose story may help save others like him. If I would have just been guilty, then my story would have been never been heard. Nobody would have took the time to listen to me. I'd have been just another criminal. Our thanks to producer Katie Yu. So this is really hard to watch. Every time that I watch, I get chills. Um, an important story, and it actually is so important for us when we talk about radical healing and when we talk about you know the impact of, of many different intergenerational trauma and the impact of the environment in you know in, in the lives, in, in real lives and in real situations. So I wonder if you do have um, any comments in the chat and and can feel free to uh, let me know if, if, if that's happening. Um, it's a true story, it's a very sad story. And, you know, we can see those um, identity wounds. We can also see the resiliency. We can see how um, systems failed and, and how um, we all can contribute to bring, um, to bring, to make a difference, to make a difference in in, in many other caliphs that unfortunately um, are are still dealing, hopefully not with similar situation, but um, um, 
but we know that it still is, is an ongoing challenge. So when we start reflecting on Khalil's experiences and identifying reminders, um, think about what potential trauma reminders did you notice, right? Did you notice for Khalif? What were the things that happened? And unfortunately, you know, we have talked about prolonged periods of um, times when trauma happened. And, you know, this kid was in, in, a, in a context, in an environment that was extremely dangerous for more than two years. Um, since the time that he was 16 years old. So it still he was, um, you know, he, he, he was a child, he, he was, uh, his brain still was in full development and, in, and he didn't really have too many options. And unfortunately, you know, poverty played a, a humongous role in, in what he was going through, right? Um, you know, uh, and many other factors uh, that affect his life immensely. And Dr. Chang, we're not yes. seeing we're not seeing your slides yet. We're still seeing the um the YouTube screen. Oh, thank you for letting me know. Okay. And there, yes. uh, while you um share your PowerPoint again, I'll just read some of the chats. Um, Perfect. Thank lost, you. Emotion, sadness, anger, um, injustice, and just the um the sadness for the parents and the flaws in the American justice system um, and just the mental trauma that contributed to this tragedy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing your, your thoughts. Now, can you see my screen? Yes, we can see it. Thank you. And if you can remove that block. Yes, then. definitely. Perfect. All right. Perfect. Okay, so the question was, what potential trauma reminders did you notice for Khalif? Um, you know, and they were, they were many, right? I mean, um, one of the reminders was, uh, you know, many of the, the experiences that he, he lived in jail and in the confinement, you know, how his mother was describing his behaviors. Um, uh, you know, I, I'm pretty sure that looking at police officers might have been a reminder. I think that I I I saw saw another interview and that was that was what he was saying. You know, um, you know, his amygdala probably was really overloaded trying to protect him and and trying to scan for any sense of danger um, after you know two years of, of, of many different events in which his life was in danger and he faced threat, right? How we're going to go. Oops, I don't know how, why, okay. So there are, we talked about invisible suitcases and how we all carry invisible suitcases in, in uh, you know, individual invisible suitcases. And these are the things that sometimes we don't even know that we're carrying them on. Um, and if we think about, uh, you know, a person who has experienced significant trauma, this invisible suitcase unpack is linked to trauma uh, and therefore expectations. So previous life experiences create expectations that guide behavior, all right? So if, if we have faced early in life, uh, unsafe world, a world that you know, we perceive as threatening, our sort of behaviors that are gonna be guided is attempts to, for us to protect ourselves. Right, not trust, not um, not lower our guards, right? Because we definitely know that we need to protect ourselves, and our brains and our bodies are telling us that. 
So expectations based on traumatic life events are shaped by experiences of danger before and following traumatic event. Messages from others and society and perceptions of best strategies to remain safe. Okay, so, so when we think and talk about context of danger, safety and protection, traumatic experiences shift expectations about threats to personal and community safety. Okay, and intergenerational trauma reflects the impact of trauma across from gener generations. So we have talked about this. And it's so important to, to consider the role of systems, right? We had seen as a, a few systems that failed Khalif and failed his family and failed his community, right? Um, and, and this is important to talk a little bit more about. Now, there is also, um, you know, uh, it is also important to figure out how failing systems um, are related to breaking the social contract, okay? And how, um, and the question is, how did systems make it easier or more difficult for Khalif to deal with his trauma reminders, right? That this is an important question. Oops. Personal and family experiences of danger beyond trauma further undermine belief in social contract. And, oops, I'm sorry, I'm going backwards. And, one of the things that is also important for us to question is how the institutions or providers make it easier. Oh, that I already, I already asked you, I'm sorry. Okay, now I'm pretty sure that most of you have heard about the adverse childhood experiences, the ACEs, right? This ACE study that was conducted in, I believe the, nine, the late 1980s, early 1990s, and for the for many different fields, especially the psychology and psychiatric field, it was very important for us to, um, and it has really moved the bar in a different direction uh, to consider important how um, adverse childhood experiences impact not only the life of a child, but the life of the individual, the whole life span of this individual, okay? So the ACEs are experiences that may be traumatic to children and youth during the first 18 years of life, such as expecting violence or other types of emotional disturbing exposures in their homes and communities, all right? The, the story comes that there was um, a psychiatrist, and there is a psychiatrist still, he's alive, by, um, uh, and I'm blanking on his name, it's gonna to come to me. I can see his picture in my mind, Feliri. Feliri is his last name. Dr. Feliri started running a weight loss clinic in California, in Kaiser Permanente. And he ran this clinic for most people in their middle age where they were chronically obese, morbidly obese, that's the right term, which meant that, you know, their weight was impacting their overall health. They presented different chronic medical conditions. And, you know, he ran this clinic because he wanted to help people to lose weight. And his clinic was very successful you know, the, he, he noticed that the, his patients were losing significantly their weight. And after a few months, he was noticing also that many of the successful stories were not coming back. They were, you know, they were just not coming back to the clinic. So he was wondering what was happening. You know, either the treatment was so successful that they didn't need to go to the clinic anymore or something else was happening and he didn't know, 
And all of the sudden, a few months later, the same patients were coming back with more weight than the what than when they started originally the uh, in the weight loss clinic. So they put up more weight than um, than in their baseline, right? And then he started thinking, I need to understand a little bit more about what's happening. And he, he actually came up with a question for one woman. And his question was, how old were you when you became, when you first became sexually active? And the woman replied to her, five years old. So then he understood that there was something happening you know, to but potentially something was happening uh, during childhood that was impacting the lives of his patients during their adulthood. So he came out with 10 questions, yes or no answers. And these 10 questions address some important and devastated adverse childhood experiences. Okay, and he shared his information and his observation to with another doctor, an epidemiologist from the CDC, Dr. Anda, and they came out together with more than 17,000 participants. And this, you know, in research, this is unheard of, right? You, you don't get too many participants. And the questions that they asked were related to abuse, whether or not before the age of 18, the individual experienced physical abuse, emotional abuse, sexual abuse, yes or no, whether or not they experienced neglect, physical neglect or emotional neglect, yes or no, and whether or not they experience uh, one caregiver uh, in the household ha had a mental illness, was incarcerated, um, uh, a mother treated violently, uh, a caregiver, one of the caregivers using substances, or if, um, if the parents were divorced. And all of it was before the age of 18, okay? And so obviously there were only 10 questions and these 10 questions were not really addressing any frequency or intensity. It was only yes or no answers, but you know they were trying to figure out something about the impact of adverse childhood experiences, right? These are some of the things that were not included in the traditional measure. Experiences of bullying, teen dating violence, peer-to-peer -peer violence, witness violence in community or school, homelessness, death of a parent, right? There were other things that were not included also, right? And it had to do with, you know, what we have um, witnessed in the interview with Khalif, right? About poverty, about discrimination about you being incarcerated before the age of 18, right? About the individual, um, you know, about uh, being separated in the border, uh, about many other experiences that community of color um, go through. Um, um, in their lives, right? So, so this traditional measure of the ACE study that was a revolutionary study for all of us did not include the experience of many other communities. And yet it was very informative for, for all communities, but we definitely need to have in mind that there are other adverse childhood experiences that marginalized communities or other communities who are non-white might be more prone to, to go through. And, and yet the results were, as I mentioned to you, revolutionary. 
So out of the more than 17 people who were surveyed, 11% um, of them endorse psychological abuse, 28% physical abuse, 21% sexual abuse, 15 emotional neglect, 10 physical neglect, 27% endorsed that one of the adults in their household was um, using substances, 23% uh, were abandoned by one parent, 17% had one parent or caregiver uh, with a mental illness, 13% uh, their mothers were better, and 6% 6 one of the caregivers had a criminal behavior. Okay, I want to also say that the people, the most of the seventeen, more of more, uh, more than seventeen participants, were predominantly uh, white from a middle class uh, status. And what they analyzing the data, what they one of the conclusions was that the more adverse childhood experiences that a person endures four or more contribute for more disrupted neurodevelopment, which actually was correlated with more social, emotional, and cognitive impairment, which was led to adoption of health, health risk behaviors, right? which led to disease, disability, and social problems, and ended up with uh, people dying 20 years earlier than when compared with their peers, with their, the, the same sort of uh, generation, okay? So, so this is some, something truly important because, you know, this, adverse childhood experiences not only have a um, psychological impact, but they also have a physical impact, social impact, you know, relational impact, many different, it affects the whole individual and it follows them through their adulthood. So there have been more recent studies that have addressed the issue of you know what happens in urban settings, what happens in these environments. And the participants were a lot smaller, but we could see here some also uh, results that can guide our treatment um, and services. So the people who were surveyed were less than 2,000. 41, almost 42% were men, 58% uh, were women. And here is the breakdown of races. So we had 42% black, 41% white, Latinos were 4%, uh, Asian 4, biracial 4, and other 2%. And here is what we see. The endorse of physical abuse is higher than the original study. The endorse of emotional abuse is also much higher, right? Uh, in comparison, um, mental illness of a caregiver is also higher. Uh, substance abuse use of a caregiver also higher. And incarceration, you know, it's not surprisingly that is also higher at 13%. So when we think about trauma, and the adverse childhood experiences, outcomes. And we try to figure out how impacts public safety and health challenges, right? We, we understand that there are things that we oftentimes don't talk about and don't consider part of services or treatment that are really important and can be the roots of many of the different challenges that are uh, being presented, right? So, you know, the importance of addressing adverse community environments, such as poverty, discrimination, community disruption, 
the lack of opportunity or economic mobility and social capital, poor housing quality and affordability, and violence, right? These are among many others. So it's so important to understand that, you know, um, yes, we're treating the individual, yes, we're sort of uh, trying many times to support the family, and we need to sort of address also how adverse community environments impact uh, many, many of the ACEs that the individuals are facing. Okay. So when we think about system-induced trauma, we, we can talk about that it is when systems responsible for protecting children and the public do not understand the impact of trauma, and they may inten unintentionally cause further harm, right? And, and, you know, I think that one very sad example is the example of Khalif, right? Um, and I think that we also see many more examples um, that are reflected in different environments and in different systems, right? So what SAMHSA also talks about is how we prevent that the system will induce more trauma is by applying the four R's. And the four R's stand for realize, recognize, respond, and resist retraumatization. Okay. And I can really go a little bit farther on this, but let me just see. Uh, let me just get through through a little bit more of the slides. So when we think about how we apply the findings of the ACE study and the urban ACE study into different contexts, I'm giving you this example of the juvenile justice one in the US, but it would be also important for you to consider in your own practices, you know, how you can apply these findings, right? So here is some good, good and sad information that, you know, it, it tells us that when we compare the original study with uh, Florida juvenile offenders, what we, we know is that 0% um, of, of um, there is a 34% 30 of uh, people from Florida juvenile offenders uh, uh, group that endorse zero uh, ACE, right? Zero adverse childhood experiences versus a 2.8 uh, that was endorsed in the original study. When we when we go to three adverse childhood experiences, one, what we see is that 21% of um, Florida juvenile offenders endorse three ACEs versus 9% that endorse, um, uh, endorse three ACEs from the original study. And I got it wrong the first one. The 34% was from the original study and the 2.8 was from, um, from the Florida Juvenile Offenders Group. Um, but remarkably, what we see, four or more ACEs are endorsed 50% in the group of Florida Juvenile Offenders versus in the original study of ACEs, um, there were 30% of uh, people who endorsed four or more ACEs. So when we know the implications in health, in the adoption of risky behaviors, in the shortening of life, uh, 
we know that the Florida juvenile offenders, the young people, the teenagers are at higher risk, even in their short lives, uh, to, you know, to really have faced many, many challenges and um, at a higher rates, higher percentages than, than other populations, such as the one that was surveyed um, in the original study, who still was presenting challenges, uh, but you know, uh, definitely um, other populations who come from marginalized communities, their challenges are multiplied uh, you know, by their environment. So that's really important to consider when we are serving them. So when we think about principles for a trauma-informed juvenile justice system, I welcome you and I invite you to think about your own system, the one that you are part of, you know, and think about safety, how you bring safety into your system, how you bring trust, how you build empowerment, uh, continue uh, promote collaboration and the peer support and trauma competence and cultural, historical, linguistic and gender responsiveness, right? All of these elements are important and the more that you work on each of them and put them together, the better results that you will get and the obviously the, the more integrated trauma-informed uh, system uh, you, you will foster. Now, um, when we think about the process of trauma-informed collaboration with youth through cultural humility can lead to safer facilities. So then what we need to um, think about is to provide youth with greater self-awareness, right? That we can do with a good safety plan, a treatment safety plan that we have talked about. The self-awareness leads to better self-control, right? Now kids start having more tools and they can organize and structure more how they're gonna use their tools. Better self-control leads to more positive coping strategies, which is really important, right? Uh, more positive coping strategies reduce violence, reduce violence, lessen injuries. Fewer injuries lead to a more positive unit environment uh, and, you know, positive environment in total. And all this lead to improve job satisfaction, to improve um, a school satisfaction, uh, relational um, interactions um, are more positive. So there are many gains uh, that can really um, be fostered when we when we really uh, focus on uh, working on a trauma informed uh, system. So, what can we do? The challenge and change the oppressive conditions that cause the wounds, right? That's that's one of the things that we can do to one another, you know, as a group, as a member of, of um, services, we can challenge each other, each other to, uh, to change these oppressive conditions that cause those uh, identity wounds that we had uh, mentioned and we had heard. Uh, working to change the current manifestations of these deep and still open injuries. This could involve reducing police killings of unarmed people, ending the practice of separating children from their parents, and placing them in detention facilities or making public or histories of oppression and resistance, right? Making public our histories of oppression and resistance. This is also important and this is what uh, the recommendation of two people who have been really working in the field and addressing these issues for a while now. So radical healing involves personal and collective actions that promote living and life with dignity and respect, such as life necessities, freedoms from all forms of oppression. Um, and the difference between 
convention, conventional treatment versus radical treatment. In a conventional treatment, we reduce the emotional pain associated with traumatic events, right? In a conventional uh, healing, focuses on individual symptom reduction, such as teaching someone how to regulate their emotional responses to racism, versus in radical healing that incorporates strategies that address the root causes of the trauma by building on the strengths of individuals and engaging the general and culture specific practices of their community that promote resilience and well-being. And such strategies can include community healing circles, intergenerational storytelling, and advocacy work. That's a must. So how we continue making a difference? We can develop pride in, in our own racial, ethnic, indigenous group, or help our patients, our colleagues develop pride in, in their racial, ethnic, indigenous group. We can share our own stories or listen to our patients or colleagues' stories. We can resist and take action, educate ourselves about an issue that is affecting our communities locally or nationally, identifying groups who are working to address the issue, join one of the group's efforts in taking collective action to create change. Um, these are other things that we can all think about doing to make a difference, maintain radical hope, or help your colleagues, patients maintain this radical hope. It is a must to practice self-care. Fighting for social justice can be exhausting. Engaging in restorative self-care practices that will benefit you and your community including getting enough sleep, eating healthy, and incorporating a spiritual practice into your daily life. You know, a, a Black feminist author and activist, Audre Lorde, eloquently stated, staying healthy in a system that undermines your very existence is the greatest act of resistance. So this is the conclusion of... Um, radical healing and trauma. And these are the take home messages, historical and inter historical intergenerational or system induced trauma can have significant impacts on youth and on people in general. Trauma leads to survival coping strategies that may be maladaptive and maladaptive coping strategies can lead to illness and premature death. And with that, I think that we are good in time. Uh, the last one is you can help youth develop more positive coping strategies utilizing a radical healing framework, which is really important. I, I know that we are good in time and I was wondering if anybody has any comments or um, any questions. Thank you for your comments. and. Uh, Karen, you will continue reading them. So one of the things that I would like to do for tomorrow, and my plan actually is coming up to be a good plan, is that I was hoping that I didn't keep you until five. So you could have, you could use the remaining 15 minutes or so to read one or two vignettes from the list of vignettes that uh, Karen have already sent to you by chat, I believe. And, you know, tomorrow we're going to um, apply some of the concepts that we have covered into the discussion of what do you see in the vignette and answering a few questions in small groups. So you could get to meet with some of other colleagues and hopefully you can, uh, you know, share your wisdom so that would be that would be the plan for a little bit i just put the vignettes file into the chat it's going to get lost as people are um chatting in so it'll mm -hmm. i'll put it in a couple more times as we answer questions and close but you'll you should be able to see it in chat and if you do not just reach out to me in chat it's karen perfect so Dr. Chang, we would like to thank you for such a powerful and thought-provoking presentation. I know I learned a lot today. Um, 
we would like to invite everyone to join us again tomorrow, June 29th at 1 Eastern for part two of the intersection between trauma and the environment. This concludes our presentation. Have a fantastic day. Take care, everyone.